Order. The clerk will now proceed to read the orders of the day. Item 1. The Care Shield Life and Long Term Care Bill, second reading. Minister for Health. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that the bill be now read a second time. Population ageing is a global phenomenon, and for Singapore, the good news is that we are living longer, and many of our seniors live fulfilling and active lives well into their silver age. However, ageing also comes with related illnesses and disability. To enable more of our seniors to age well with dignity and purpose, we need to prepare ahead of time. We need to look at how we can better organize social and health care, how we can enable our seniors to stay healthy, age in place and continue to contribute to the community, and how we can support them in their medical and long-term care needs. We have made significant progress in these areas over the past few years. In 2015, we implemented MediShield Life to provide universal health coverage with better protection for all so that all Singaporeans have peace of mind for their hospitalization bills. And for life, so that older Singaporeans are covered too, regardless of their age. That year, we also developed the Action Plan for Successful Aging with various stakeholders, which now has over 70 initiatives underway to empower our seniors to live well, even as we live longer. Earlier this year, we announced the Caregiver Support Action Plan to strengthen the support for caregiving for our seniors. And these include the Home Caregiving Grant, Respite Care Services, and Caregiver Empowerment and Training. More recently, we introduced the Medeca Generation Package to thank the Medeca Generation for their contributions to Singapore and provide more support for their health care and long-term care needs in their civil years. This follows the Pioneer Generation Package that was introduced in 2014. One important area we need to address is long-term care financing. In 2016, the Elder Shield Review Committee was set up to look into how we can provide greater financial support for Singaporeans who become severely disabled during old age. After rigorous deliberation and extensive public consultation, the committee submitted its report to the government last year with the following key recommendations. First, universal insurance coverage for Singaporeans born in 1980 or later, regardless of their health, disability and financial status, so that our future generations will have their basic protection against the cost of long-term care. Secondly, higher payouts that increase over time and are for life, so that Singaporeans are better supported for as long as they remain severely disabled. And simpler claim processes so that severely disabled Singaporeans and their caregivers can apply for claims more conveniently. The government accepted the recommendations made by the committee and the report was debated in Parliament in July last year. We announced our plan to introduce casual life. The risk pooling approach through the universal insurance coverage for casual life reflects our desire to de a nurture an inclusive and caring society. I'm glad that we had received support from members of this House. Once again, I would like to thank the committee for their work. Financing our long-term care is a shared responsibility. We come together as a society to pool our risks through insurance, casual life and elder shield to address the variability of long-term care costs. Individuals and their families also play a part through their own savings. And the government provides significant support through subsidies and assistance schemes, particularly toward the lower income. All these three pillars are essential, insurance, savings and government support. And achieving the right balance among them is crucial in keeping our system inclusive, affordable and sustainable. Therefore, in addition to strengthening insurance, we have concurrently reviewed how other financing sources of long-term care can complement casual life and elder shield to better support Singaporeans with disability. We will enhance government support for long-term care through the establishment of Elder Fund in January 2020. 
Other funds will be a discretionary government assistance scheme for low-income, severely disabled Singapore citizens who are aged 30 and above. It will provide up to $200, $250 per month, especially to those who are unable to join Cashew Life, have low Medisave balances and face financial difficulties in meeting their long-term care needs. This is in addition to existing subsidies of up to 80% for long-term care services such as nursing homes and various other government disability assistance schemes. Around mid-2020, we will also be extending the use of Medisave by allowing Singaporeans who, to withdraw cash from their own and their spouse's Medisave for their long-term care needs. Severely disabled Singaporeans who are at least 30 years old will be able to make cash withdrawals of up to $200 a month from their own and their spouse's Medisave accounts to support their long-term care needs. This casual life and long-term care bill provides the legislative framework for the establishment, governance and administration of the casual life scheme and also facilitates the implementation of other long-term care financing measures for the severely disabled I mentioned earlier. Mr. Speaker, I shall now highlight the key provisions of the bill. First, Clause 5 of the bill provides for the establishment of the Cashew Life Scheme. It provides for the CPF Board to administer Cashew Life and be responsible for the issuance and servicing of the insurance policies, premium collection, payment of benefits, and management of the Cashew Life and Elder Shield Insurance Fund. I'll talk about the fund in a short while. We will also be appointing the Agency for Integrated Care, AIC, as the administrator. AIC will be responsible for the assessment of an individual's eligibility for the claim by ascertaining his or her disability status. This division in administrative roles between CPF Board and AIC allows us to tap on the expertise of the respective agencies. In particular, as AIC administers all of MOH's disability schemes, AIC will be the natural touch point for seniors. They are best placed to advise disabled seniors and their caregivers on the various forms of long-term care services and financing schemes they can tap on. Clause 6 of the bill defines the groups of individuals that will be covered under the Cashew Life Scheme. In line with our vision for inclusivity, the scheme will apply to all Singapore citizens and permanent residents born on 1st January 1980 or later. Those who are at least 30 years old will be covered when the scheme is launched. Subsequent cohorts will be covered on their birthday when they turn 30 years old. This provides universal coverage for future generations of Singaporeans, ensuring casual life coverage for them regardless of their health, pre-existing disability or financial status. However, the scheme will be optional for older cohorts of Singapore citizens and permanent residents born in 1979 or earlier. And they can join the scheme if they do not have pre-existing severe disability. The Elder Shield Review Committee had recommended to keep the scheme optional for them because their circumstances and their needs could vary widely. But to encourage participation of the younger cohorts of this group, we will auto-enroll those born between 1970 and 1979 who are Elder Shield policyholders policy and are not severely disabled. This makes it more convenient for them to join and they can still choose to opt out before 31st December 2023 if they wish to do so. So they will be auto-enrolled but they have an option to opt out of the scheme and they can do so up to 31st December 2023. The new Cashew Life Scheme will be launched around mid-2020 for Singaporeans born in 1980 or later, and we aim to progressively launch the scheme for Singaporeans born in 1979 or earlier, from mid-2021, about a year later. The bill also provides for Cashew Life to cover all individuals who become Singapore citizens or permanent residents after the scheme commences. These are the new citizens or new PRs. This way, all new SCs, Singapore citizens and PRs will participate in this national scheme 
and benefit from better support for their future long-term care needs, just like all Singapore citizens and permanent residents today. The only exception is if they are born in 1979 or earlier, the older uh, uh, SEs and PRs, and are severely disabled, like Singapore citizens and PRs in those cohorts who are already severely disabled at the launch of Casual Life, they will also not be allowed to join the scheme. Next, let me touch on Elder Shield. Part 3 of the bill provides for government administration of the Elder Shield scheme. As announced earlier this year, we are transferring the Elder Shield scheme, which is currently administered by private insurers, to the government. This will be done in mid-2021, together with the launch of Casual Life for older Singaporeans born in 1979 or earlier. The transfer allows Elder Shield to be administered on a not-for-profit not basis, with CPF Board and AIC as the government's key administrators. This will facilitate a smooth upgrading from Elder Shield to Casual Life for those who choose to do so. This bill will disapply the Insurance Act to the transfer, as otherwise the Elder Shield portfolios cannot be transferred to the government because the government is not included in the definition of transferee in the Insurance Act. However, in practice, we will take reference from the requirements MAS has put in place in governing the transfer to protect policyholders. This includes appointing an independent external auditor to audit the transfer and providing MAS with a full audit reports. Those who choose not to upgrade to casual life will remain covered by their existing Elder Shield policy. I would like to ensure Elder Shield policyholders that the terms and conditions of their Elder Shield policy will remain. In addition, they will also benefit from the improvements to the claim process that will be implemented for casual life. Now let me move on to the benefits and payouts of the schemes. Casual life and Elder Shield will remain as basic schemes to benefit severely disabled policyholders as provided in, clauses, in Clause 12 of the Bill. This keeps premiums affordable, which is crucial for a national scheme like casual life that caters to a broad segment of Singaporeans. Policyholders who prefer higher coverage or better benefits can buy supplements from private insurers. Existing supplements administered by the private insurers will not be transferred to the government. Clause 16 of the bill provides for claims to be made for casual life or elder shield payouts. We recognize that being severely disabled can be a stressful situation for policyholders and their caregivers. Hence, we want to make their claim process more convenient. To this end, we plan to double the number of disability assessors to about 300 by the launch of Casual Life. And we are working with healthcare institutions to progressively expand the types of disability assessments that can be accepted for claims so that policyholders need not undergo another disability assessment if we already have similar data on their disability status. To further provide convenience to policyholders, Part 8 of the bill will enable CPF Board and the AIC to access an individual's disability-related health information and allow the information to be disclosed to authorised persons approved by the Minister for the administration of prescribed public schemes or provision of support to disabled persons for prescribed purposes. These provisions allow us to proactively reach out to disabled individuals to inform them of their eligibility for claims, not just for casual life and elder shield, but also for other government disability schemes using disability assessments already performed at our healthcare institutions. These provisions also allow us to access and use disability assessments already done at healthcare institutions to assess the eligibility of those born between 1970 and 1979 for the auto enrollment exercise into the casual life without having to get them to be assessed again. Nonetheless, individuals can opt out from, this assess, from the access and disclosure of such disability related health information, and we will release more details on how individuals can do so nearer the launch date. 
But I should point out that if they do so, if they do opt out of the access and disclosure of the information, they will lose some, in, some convenience. For example, severely disabled individuals will not receive any proactive outreach to apply for claims because we do not know their disability status. And they may need to go for a separate disability assessment even if they have been assessed for disability recently at a healthcare institution. In addition, individuals born between 1970 and 1979 will not be auto-enrolled and may need to go for a disability assessment in order to join Cashew Life. Part 8 of the bill also enables CPF board and AIC to access, subject to certain safeguards, and individuals' confidential information in the possession of another government department or public authority for the administration of Cashew Life, Elder Shield, and prescribed social or health care related public schemes. Again, this is meant to increase convenience for policyholders. The bill makes the wrongful access, use, or disclosure of any information collected an offence. If convicted, a person may be liable for a fine of up to $5,000 or imprisonment of up to 12 months or both. Overall, we want to strike a careful balance between facilitating access and convenience for Singaporeans with the safeguarding of health and confidential information. Mr. Speaker, another key feature of Cashew Life and Elder Shield is that payouts will be in cash. Elder Shield, uh, this will give uh, claimants the flexibility to decide on their preferred care arrangement so that they can remain at home or in the community if they wish and still receive the cash payouts. However, it is important that these cash payouts are safeguarded. We will balance between such flexibility and the need for safeguards in several ways. First, some severely disabled policyholders may lack mental capacity and are unable to manage their cash payouts or even apply for claims in the first place. In this case, a donor or a deputy can act on their behalf to apply for claims and receive and manage the payouts. In the absence of a donor or a deputy, Clause 16 of the bill allows certain family members or caregivers to be authorized applicants to make claims on behalf of such policy holders and receive payouts as approved payees so as to support the care of the policy holders. However, to safeguard against the risk of misuse or fraud, the classes of persons who can make or receive claims will be a tight list approved by the minister and generally limited to those who are caregivers for the policyholder. They can only receive the payouts for a limited period of one year, subject to appeals for an extension if necessary, to give them time to apply to be appointed as deputy for the policyholder. Second, we will allow policyholders or their authorized applicants to nominate healthcare institutions caring for the policyholders, such as nursing homes, as approved payees under the bill. This will ensure the continuity of their care. Third, we will require third-party payees to first apply the payouts for policyholders' care as provided in Clause 50 of the bill. Not doing so without reasonable excuse is an offence. If convicted, the penalty is double that for the offence for false declarations or wrongful access of information under Clause 48 of the bill, given that these are offences against vulnerable persons. This ensures that payouts are prioritized for the care of the policyholder. Further, we will protect the payouts from creditors. Clause 20 of the bill protects casual life and elder shield payouts from creditors with two tight exceptions. First, the bill allows premium debt to be netted off from the payouts, and we will use this only in the case of willful defaulters who do not pay casual life premiums but have made claims to benefit from the scheme. We will do so in a calibrated manner and will cap the amount of debt netted off from the payouts each month to ensure that policyholders will continue to receive the bulk of the payouts to meet their long-term care needs. The second case is where there are monies owed by the policyholder to a healthcare institution, for instance a nursing home arising from the care provided to the policyholder. If the policyholder or authorised applicant has already directed the payouts to this institution. This ensures that healthcare institutions providing care to the policyholder 
can continue to be adequately resourced to do so. Sir, I will now move on to premiums. Clause 14 requires the Cash Shield Life and Elder Shield policyholders pay their premiums in a timely manner. This is so that the schemes will remain solvent and sustainable, and to be fair to other policyholders who have dutifully paid their premiums. For those who need help with their Cash Shield Life premium payments, we will put in place measures to ensure premiums remain affordable. There will be means-tested premium subsidies of up to 30% to help lower to middle-income Singaporeans with their premiums. Transitional subsidies will be given to Singapore citizens born in 1980 or later for the first five years from Cash Shield Life's commencement to ease the transition into the scheme. For Singapore citizens born in 1979 or earlier, they will be given participation incentives of up to $2,500 if they join Cash Shield Life in the first two years after the scheme is available for sign-ups from mid-2021. This is to encourage early participation in the scheme. In addition, seniors from Pioneer Generation and the Medeca Generation will receive additional participation incentives of $1,500 so that they would receive a total of $4,000 in participation incentives. The participation incentives will be netted off their premiums payable over a period of 10 years thereby reducing the amount of premiums that the policyholders will need to pay. Policyholders who need further help with their cash shield life premiums, even after premium subsidies and support measures, can receive additional premium support. This is similar to MediShield Life and is the government's commitment to ensure that premiums remain affordable and that no one loses cash shield life coverage due to his or her inability to pay. However, there may be a small group of willful defaulters who refuse to pay their cash flow life premiums despite having the means to do so, even after reminders have been sent to them. Any cash flow life premiums defaulted that cannot be recovered is a burden that will be shouldered by other policyholders in the form of higher premiums eventually. To be fair to the other policyholders, we need to take a strict stance against these willful defaulters. Therefore, Part 7 of the Bill provides for a premium recovery framework that is similar to the approach for medical life. Penalties and interest can be imposed on outstanding premiums, and we intend to similarly appoint RIS as a recovery body to recover outstanding premiums. Let me reiterate that for those who genuinely need help, we will help them with the premium payments. For eldership policyholders who do not pay their premiums, their Elder Shield cover will lapse after the grace period, similar to their current terms and conditions. Premiums collected under the Cash Shield Life and Elder Shield will flow into the Cash Shield Life and Elder Shield Insurance Fund that will be established by Clause 35 of the Bill. The insurance fund will be a self-sustaining fund supported by the premium collected under both schemes. The Cash Shield Life and Elder Shield Insurance Fund will be managed by CPF Board in a not-for-profit manner for the benefit of policyholders. The insurance fund monies can only be used for policyholders' benefits and scheme administration. The government or CPF Board as a fund administrator cannot remove any fund monies for its own use except for the cost of operating the scheme. Let me now touch on the issues of governance. I want to assure Singaporeans that there are safeguards in place to ensure proper scheme governance for both cash flow life and eldership. These include safeguards over the scheme parameters and administration, the collection of premiums and payment of claims, and management of information. Let me elaborate. First, the governance of scheme parameters and administration will be overseen by an independent cash flow life council to be appointed by the Minister under Clause 37 of the Bill. The Council will review and make recommendations on policy and scheme parameters to ensure that the schemes provide protection for Singaporeans in an affordable and sustainable manner. This includes reviewing cash flow lives, premiums and payout increases beyond 2025. For the first five years of cash flow lives implementation until 2025, both premiums and payouts will increase 
at 2 per cent per year. Adjustments thereafter will be reviewed by the Council. In addition, the Council will review the administration of the schemes and advise on matters related to the investment of Casual Life and Elder Shield Insurance Fund. The Council will be appointed by the time the Casual Life scheme takes effect. It will comprise members with various professional expertise and a wide range of experience to perform the key functions of the Council. We are in the midst of setting up the Council and we will share more information later. Second, the Bill aims to ensure proper collection of premiums and payment of claims to protect the interests of policyholders. Clauses 48 and 49 of the Bill make false declarations and fraudulent disability assessments offences with penalties to deter such offences. As mentioned earlier, the Bill will also enhance the role of personal and family savings and government support in helping the severely disabled with their long-term care costs. These measures will help older Singaporeans who are not covered under Elder Shield or Casual Life. Severely disabled Singapore citizens and PRs who are at least 30 years old will be able to make cash withdrawals from their own and their spouse's Medisafe accounts to support their long-term care needs. Clause 66 of the Bill will amend the CPF Act to allow for this. To ensure that members have sufficient Medisafe balances for other medical treatments, the amount that can be withdrawn for long-term care will be based on their prevailing Medisafe balance and up to $200 a month for each severely disabled individual. These cash withdrawals will supplement the casual life or eldership payouts that they may be receiving. Uh, this will enhance the role of personal and family savings in supporting long-term care needs. Like Casual Life and Elder Shield, similar safeguards will be in place for those who lack mental capacity. Apart from allowing withdrawals from Medisafe for long-term care, the government will also play a part in helping Singaporeans with the cost of long-term care. The bill provides for the establishment of a government fund called the Long-Term Care Support Fund in clauses 38 and 39. This fund will be administered by Ministry of Health. $5.1 billion will be set aside in this fund as announced by DPM during the Budget 2019. Monies in the fund will be used to fund premiums, subsidies and participation incentives for a casual life scheme and to provide financial support for severely disabled persons under prescribed public schemes such as Elder Fund, which I mentioned earlier. Elder Fund is a new discretionary government assistance scheme that will be, that will be implemented in January 2020. The Long-Term Care Support Fund is in addition to existing government subsidies for long-term care services such as nursing homes, home care and centre-based care services. Existing government assistance schemes as well as the new home caregiving grant. I would like to emphasize that the Long-Term Care Support Fund is a completely separate fund from the Casual Life and Elder Shield Insurance Fund. The Long-Term Care Support Fund or the Support Fund holds the 5.1 billion of government monies and is used to provide government support. While the Casual Life and Elder Shield Insurance Fund, or we call the Insurance Fund, holds the premium monies collected and are used for casual life and elder shield payouts and expenses. So just to repeat, the support fund how holds the government funding to help the scheme to premiums and so on, whereas the insurance fund holds the money from premium payments, which is used to fund payouts from the schemes. So the two funds are separate. Both funds will be accounted for and managed separately, and the accounts for each fund will be made public. Mr. Speaker, let me now conclude. Our society is ageing, and we need to prepare for this ahead of time. Casual life is a major step in expanding the role of insurance in the long-term care financing landscape, but the Casual Life and Long-Term Care Bill goes beyond long-term care insurance. The bill also enables enhancements to be made to the other two pillars of our long-term care financing system, the withdrawal of Medisafe for long-term care and Elder Fund. 
With the strengthening of the rules of insurance, savings and government assistance, Singaporeans can have better protection and greater assurance for their long-term care needs. This way, Singaporeans can live long and with greater peace of mind. Thank you.